Good afternoon. So good to see everybody today. It's so hard not to say good morning. We're not used to being here at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But aren't we glad that even though the weather has not been all that conducive to being out and about and the roads are still slick in many places, aren't we thankful that we are, are that we are able to be here for even just this one service today? I want to begin by thanking Brother Don Gillian and Brother Jared Dubchek for working this morning to get the front cleared out here. There was still quite a bit of snow and ice that was up against the front of the building, the walk there, and both of those two men worked hard this morning to get that clear so that we could uh, be here today to have this service, and we appreciate you for the work that you did. We, we certainly thank you for that. We're glad to be able to be here today. If I had known that David Pierce was going to be the one to read the scripture this morning, I would have let him read all the way down through verse 15 because I need help uh, figuring out how to pronounce some of these names that we see here in this chapter. Now, I'm just joking. Good to have good to have David and Treva. David preached at Herndon down close to Jonesboro this morning and glad that they're able to be with us this afternoon as well. But we need to remember all of those in our prayers that are on our sick list. We had quite a lengthy list this morning. We've got quite a few that are still battling a variety of different illnesses, some minor, some major. We have those that are recovering from surgeries, those who are facing other procedures in the future. We've got a lot of people that are in need of our prayers, and we need to remember each one of them at this time. Those of you that are able to be here on Wednesday nights who are a part of our class here in the auditorium, you know that we are engaged in a study of Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 is often referred to as the Hall of Faith. In this great chapter, we find many examples of those who are remembered for their great exhibitions of faith, things that we're able to look to, that we can emulate in our life that will aid us in growing in our faith and our devotion to God. For example, we see Abel and Enoch being recognized for the actions that they took which were pleasing to God. We find the parents of Moses, Moses himself and Rahab, being commended for defying evil rulers in order to hold firm to the word of God. We find listed Gideon, Barak, David, Abraham, Moses, Samson, and Jephthah. And you go back and you read the stories of these individuals and you find that each one of them had to overcome some tremendous shortcomings in order to become mighty servants of God. And we're remembered, or we remember them for the things that they overcame and then the things that they accomplished as a result of their faith in God. We read about Joseph and Moses and Daniel and the variety of different trials and suffering that they had to endure because of their faith. We read of Rahab and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Lot, all narrowly avoiding death. But with each one of those individuals, what spared their life was their faith in God. They're willing to act when they were called upon to do so. Samson, Daniel, and David all were spared from wild animals. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph were commended for holding up the will of God and pronouncing, I guess you would say, uncommon blessings upon their children, but they were things that they had to do in order to stay congruent with what the Word of God had instructed for them to do. Now these and numerous other examples that we find in that chapter are given to us so that we can learn from their example, so that we can see that even if there are weaknesses in our life, even if we do have many things to overcome, even if we do face many trials in life, if we will remain faithful to God, then we will be blessed just as they were blessed. But something that I want you to notice, did you notice that each one of these figures that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 
are all Old Testament figures. These are all individuals who lived either either under the um, patriarchal system or they lived under the law of Moses. They were faithful to the law that was in force at that time. And certainly there are things that we can learn from them that we can apply to our Christian faith today. But what if I told you that there is a chapter in the New Testament that we could look to that gives us a list of New Testament figures of faith? New Testament examples that we could look to that are striving for the very same things that we're striving for today. That are living under the same system. That are expected to have the same faith and devotion. If you will turn with me to Romans chapter 16. In this chapter we find just such a list. Now one of the things that's always been interesting to me about this list is these are individuals who were noted for their faith during the very early days of the church. Days when Christians were facing tremendous persecution. Days when it was not the popular thing to be a Christian. But these were individuals that despite the issues going on in the world around them, them they remained faithful. But also... We're able to look at these individuals and we're able to make applications just as we are to those in Hebrews chapter 11. We're able to make applications to our life from the examples that we see set forth here in Romans chapter 16 as well. In fact, one commentator put it this way. It said in Romans chapter 16, God has opened a window to us to see what the faithful were like in the first century. And I think that's a very good way of looking at this because we're able to see some of the things that they engaged in, the kinds of behaviors that made up their character. But also, many of the individuals that are listed in this chapter, other than the mentioning of their name in this one place, they have been completely lost to history. These are individuals who were recognized for their faithful service. But these are individuals unlike those that we read of in Hebrews chapter 11 who are remembered in great detail for the things that they did. Here are individuals, and the way that I like to look at this, here were individuals who humbly lived the Christian life. They carried out their work. They engaged in that work in their local communities, their Uh, Their acclaim was not very widespread. But yet, here were individuals who were significant to God. Here were individuals that Paul had come into contact with. And they were ones who had influenced him. Ones who he admired for the faith that they exhibited in their life. But yet, what we're going to see today is that there are still things that we can learn about these individuals that will influence our faith even to this day. In this chapter, we start out with the mention of a lady, a lady by the name of Phoebe. Verses 1 and 2 says, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. And assist her in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. So here was a lady who was very well known, not only to the Apostle Paul, but was well known to other traveling evangelists, more than likely well known to other apostles as well, as someone who was a strong worker in the church, a faithful helper in the church. More than likely, Paul had met her after leaving Corinth in Acts chapter 18 and verse 18. He came to Centria. And more than likely, this was where he came into contact with this lady. And her willingness to work, her devotion to seeing the cause of Christ grow and thrive was something that was commendable. Now, there are many people today that want to look at this passage and try to make the claim that 
Phoebe was serving as a deacon in the church at Centuria. And the reason they make that claim is because this term that is translated servant, we find is also in some places translated as deacon. It's the same term. But the way that we know that Chloe, or that Phoebe here, could not possibly have been serving as a deacon, meaning a, a, a servant in some official capacity, is because she could not meet the qualification of 1 Timothy 3 and verse 11. Because in that verse, it tells us very plainly that a deacon must have a wife. And so that would exclude females from being in that position. And so whenever we look at this passage, and it talks about the fact that Phoebe was a servant in the church, by understanding that it was impossible for her to be serving in that official capacity as a deacon, then we're left with the conclusion that Phoebe was like any other faithful Christian lady, doing what she could, serving others diligently in the local church, carrying out the tasks that were before her. And as a result of that, she was remembered and recognized for her faith. Probably the most well-known individuals that we find listed in this chapter are the next two, Aquila and Priscilla. In verses 3 through 5, Paul says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. So starting out, here we find a faithful Christian husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla. They serve as an excellent example of the good that can be accomplished when you have a husband and wife who are both faithful children of God, who are working together to further the cause of Christ. Paul had met this couple at Corinth. And in some way, the scriptures do not document, the historical record neither documents this either, of exactly what it was that they had done that caused them to put their life at risk in order to serve him. Now there are some that speculate that possibly one of the times that he was in prison, maybe they had been coming in and bringing supplies or what have you to him, providing for him in some way that was illegal for them to do. And so possibly this was a way that they had put, their self, put themselves at risk in order to provide for him. But what we do know is that in some way, here was a couple that had suffered for the cause of Christ. They had been persecuted in some way, but they were willing to put their lives at risk in order to see the cause of Christ continue to further. But you notice also, notice it says, but also all the churches of the Gentiles give their thanks to Aquila and Priscilla. So whenever we look at that, it leads us to believe that all of the churches of the Gentiles were grateful to Aquila and Priscilla for in some way sparing the life of Paul. Now this has led some to believe, and I think there's some evidence that would support this, that whatever this incident was that happened, more than likely began or more than likely took place in the very early days of Paul's ministry. Before he had gone on his missionary journeys, before he had established many of the churches in Gentile areas, therefore this statement is being made that these Gentile churches are thankful to Aquila and Priscilla because if they had not been there, if they had not put themselves at risk in order to spare my life, it's possible that those churches would not have come into establishment. It's possible that there were people who were Christians that would never have heard the gospel if Aquila and Priscilla had not taken the steps that they had taken. And so they were grateful. Paul is expressing his gratitude the Gentile churches are expressing their gratitude because here was a couple who was willing to do whatever it took, even if it meant the risk of laying down their life. Whatever it took to further the cause of Christ, 
That's what they were willing to do. But then, as we saw further on down in verse 5, we see mention of a man by the name of Epinetus. Epinetus, some translations refer to him this way. It says that he was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Now, due to what is said in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 15, we can concur that if indeed he was the first convert in Asia, we can deduce that he would have been a part of the household of Stephanus. Because there in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 15, we're told that the household of Stephanus, they were the first converts in Asia. And so, if indeed this is the case, then more than likely Epinetus in some way was a part of this household of Stephanus. But here was a man, now that you think about this, imagine being the very first person in your region. Imagine being the first person in the state of Arkansas to place your faith in Christ Jesus. Imagine being the first person in the city of Pocahontas to place your faith in Christ Jesus. No one else was doing this. No one else was believing this. He was living in a region that was still devoted to idol worship. But here was a man who was so set in his faith, so set in his convictions, that he was willing to step out in faith. He was willing to become one of the first converts in that area. And he acted in true faith by becoming a Christian and serving God. Paul then goes on to mention another lady. And this lady is one that history remembers as Mary of Rome. And we find her referred to that way because as you read through the New Testament, we find six different women with the name Mary. And it can be very difficult to determine which is which. And so a lot of your first and second century historical writers, when they were referring to this lady that is mentioned here in Romans chapter 16, they put onto the end of her name of Rome. And this was simply an indicator of who she was uh, in retrospect to the other Marys that are mentioned in the New Testament. Now, all we know about this woman is that she was a strong worker. She was faithful and diligent like Phoebe and Priscilla. And we see that all three of these ladies are remembered for their work in carrying out the cause of Christ. They're remembered for their faithfulness. Then as we come down into verse 7, we find two individuals here mentioned, Andronicus and Junia. He says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. These two individuals stand out as being fellow prisoners. More than likely, what this is referring to is that these were men who had been arrested for the cause of Christ, possibly had served time in prison along with the Apostle Paul. But notice also it says that these are individuals who have been followers of Christ longer than Paul had. These were individuals who had come to faith in Christ very early on. And they had remained faithful to that. Now there are some that look at this and they want to argue that this is a married couple. They say Andronicus is a husband, Junia is a wife. And the reason they say that is because most of the time in the Greek language when you have a name in with the letter A. Generally that is a feminine form. And so people look at this and they say, well, Junia was a woman. Well, when you go back and you look at the actual way that this is uh, worded in Greek, this name should actually be Junius. There should actually be an S on the end of that name, which would make this a masculine name. But it's also been speculated. Notice that Paul refers to them as his countrymen, or some translations say his kinsmen. Some have speculated that these were individuals who were actually related to to Paul in some way by blood. It could be that they were of Hebrew descent. It could be that they were related to him uh, in some more close fashion. 
Now, we can't make any definite statements in that regard, but certainly by the way that he refers to them, these are statements that often referred to those who were close family relations, close family members of each other. But regardless if they were related to Paul or not, what we find is that here you have two faithful Christian men who were willing to even be thrown into prison for their promotion of the faith. And notice it says that these were men who were respected not only by the Apostle Paul, but all the apostles that he had come into contact with. All of the apostles, uh, they, they respected these two men. The list goes on. It talks about Amplius and Urbanus. These are mentioned in verses 8 and 9. Nothing else is recorded in the biblical record or the historical record about these two individuals. But what we are able to ascertain is that these two names, Amplius and Urbanus, were names that were commonly given to freed slaves. In those days when the Romans would take prisoners and and would turn them into slaves, after a while they would be released, but from time to time they would be required to take on different names. And we find that there were certain names that were commonly given to these freed slaves. Two of those names are Amplius and Urbanus. Well, it is believed that these two individuals came from Greek descent, that they had been Uh, taken probably as prisoners of war, had been pressed into slavery by the Romans, and then upon their release, they were given these names, but then they came into contact with Christians. They become faithful children of God, and there's an inscription that has been discovered in the city of Rome that has been traced back to the year 115 A.D., and on that inscription, it gives a list of, of freed slaves who had become Christians in the very early days of the church. And guess what two names are included on that inscription? Amplius and Urbanus. So here we find that these two are remembered as being faithful Christian workers. Then we find a man by the name of Stachus. Stachus is mentioned in verse 9. Once again, this was a very common name that was, given to, uh, that was given to slaves. It was a name that was of Greek origin. But the only other Roman reference to the name Stachus. And this is something that I found very interesting. There was an inscription that was found that not only gave a list of freed slaves who had become a part of the church, But it also gave a list of Christians who were a part of Caesar's household. You may remember Philippians 4 and verse 22. Paul talks about the fact that the gospel had even permeated Caesar's household. And that there were those who were a part of his own family. That dwelt in his palace who had become servants of God. One of the names on that inscription that was found was the name Stachus. Early historians, Hippolytus and Dorotheus, they recorded that Stachus was one of the 70 that Jesus had sent out in Luke 10. But if indeed Stachus was a Greek who had been taken prisoner and carried to Rome and then became a trusted part of Caesar's household, then he could not have been one of the 70 of Luke chapter 10 because the 70 of Luke chapter 10 were all Jews. Well, here was a man who would have come from Gentile lineage. And so he would not have fit. Another historian named Callistus recorded that Stachus was originally from the Greek city of Byzantium. He was taken to Rome as a prisoner, and upon being freed, he came into contact with the church at Rome, became a child of God, and then carried his faith back to his home city of Byzantium, where he eventually became an elder in the church. So here is a man who at the time of Paul's writing more than likely was just beginning his walk with Christ. But here was a man that regardless of which status is in reference here and what this man went on to accomplish, we know that this was a man who was loved by Paul. He's listed as a beloved servant. 
Paul recognized something special about this man. And no doubt he would go on to accomplish great things for his faith. He then goes on to list 17 additional individuals. These are all individuals who are recognized for their faithful service to God. But these are all individuals that we know very, very little about. Notice verses 10 through 16. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegion, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Neruus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. So as we look at this list, these are names that we're not familiar with. Apelles, we're simply told that he was approved in Christ. Another way of putting this was here was someone who was a tried and true servant of God. Someone who could be trusted to be faithful. It talks about Aristobulus and his family. One of the things that I found that was interesting is when you go back and you study the history of that time, there is only one person named Aristobulus that is listed in any of the historical records of that time, and lo and behold, he was the grandson of Herod the king. Herod the king was the one who was the ruler over Judea at the birth of Christ, who tried to kill Christ. Now, it would make sense then, whenever we look at the next name that Paul mentions, if this person was indeed the grandson of Herod the Great, because you notice the next name is what? Herodian. Herodian is a name that would indicate a connection to the Herodian family. And so we find that not only had the gospel permeated the household of Caesar, we find that it had also permeated the household of the Herods. Some of the strongest opponents to the early church. The gospel had come to impact those households as well. We then see two other ladies, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Tradition, now mind you, this is not coming from the Bible, but this is historical tradition. It states that these two women were identical twins. That they were sisters who became very faithful members of the church. But also these names, Tryphena and Tryphosa, were names that would have been indicative of someone of great wealth. And so it's believed that these two ladies were ones who were very wealthy as well. And so nevertheless, we find that they were recognized for their faithful service to God. And I'm trying to go through this very quickly. I know that uh, our time is, is past, but I want to get through this very quickly. Notice Paul next mentions someone by the name of Persis. And he refers to Persis as the beloved. In a somewhat comical interpretation that I found in a number of sources... There are some individuals who believe that this woman, and certainly Persis was a female name, they say that Persis was, so to speak, the girlfriend of the Apostle Paul. And the reason they say that is because the Greek term that is here translated beloved, generally, not always, but generally, had more of an affectionate or romantic connotation to it. And so they look at this and they say that when Paul thought about Persis, he saw her as someone that that he felt a more special bond to, that more than likely they had had some type of, uh, of, of friendly relationship with each other at some point. Well, there's nothing in the Scriptures that indicate that. But also, when we apply the accepted rules of grammar to what's being used in this passage, we find that it is not Paul who sees Persis as beloved, 
But notice that the main subject of this is the church. The church had great affection for this woman. Now you stop and you think with me for just a moment. Is there ever a time when we as children of God, as part of a congregation of the Lord's church, come to have a special strong bond with certain members in the congregation? Sure. Ones that are especially encouraging, ones that are strong workers, those that we that we eagerly anticipate seeing because we get such uh, encouragement from being with them. You know, we might think of them in a, a more close, more affectionate way. And so that's why this is the term that's being used here to refer to Persis. She was a much appreciated and loved Christian lady. A few others, and we'll go through these just very quickly. We have mention of a man by the name of Rufus. There are many who say that Rufus mentioned here is the son of Simon of Cyrene, who was compelled to carry the cross of Christ in Mark 15 and verse 21. Now, in Mark 15 and verse 21, we find mention of two sons of Simon of Cyrene. Their names were Alexander and Rufus. Now, why would those two names be mentioned if they did not play any type of a part in the Mark 15 account? I think it's because when Mark penned his gospel later on, Alexander and Rufus had come to be well known in the church. Rufus was a man who came to be a strong, faithful servant of God. And so it would be like if... Uh, For example, if we were going to talk about Phil Futrell, and there's some here that I know had never had the honor of meeting Phil Futrell, we might refer to him as David and Kara's dad. Does it mean that the story that we're talking about that David and Kara had anything to do with? Not necessarily, but it's an identifier. And so more than likely, and I think all the evidence points to this, that this man that Paul is referring to, more than likely was the son of Simon of Cyrene, who had carried the cross of Christ. Verse 15, it lists five Christians that we know absolutely nothing about. And I'm not going to try to pronounce their names again. If you want to read it, you go right ahead. We know nothing about these men, other than the fact that they were faithful. And they're being recognized for their faith. As well, you read through, notice it mentions congregations, it mentions brethren, it mentions other individuals, not by name but as groupings. And so we find scores of people here that are being recognized for their faith. And although, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, most of these people, their stories have been lost to history. We know nothing of their works. We know nothing about their labor. We know nothing about where they lived, what churches they were a part of, what, how they served. We know nothing about that. But what we do know is that they were faithful Christians. They were recognized for their faith. But really, when it comes down to it, the details of their life is not what matters. Even though we don't know the things that they engaged in in life, we know that they lived a faithful Christian life. But what does matter is we understand that in Revelation 14 and verse 13, a heavenly voice spoke to John, told him, write this down, this is important. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Folks, we may not know much about what these people did, but God knows. God knows. And that's what matters. Now there's a couple of things I want us to think about today as we bring this lesson to a close. As we read through the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament both, we cannot help but be impressed by these examples of faith. We can't help but have our spirits lifted by reading about their stories and Feel admiration toward them for their devotion to God. But also, as most of you know, I enjoy church history. 
And we can go back over the last 2,000 years and we can read about many other faithful people that have carried on the cause of Christ up to this very point. And many of those people are what I commonly like to refer to as little people in the church. People like these that we're reading about here in the book of Romans. People that their name was not known, very widespread, but you better believe that they were known in their community. They were known in the local church. And they're remembered by those who had an influence upon them. They were pillars of faithful devotion. But these were individuals who were content to do their work. To labor in the field where they were planted. As well, I enjoy going back and looking at old church directories. I've got a number of old directories from several different congregations in northeast Arkansas and southeast Missouri. And you go back and you look at all of these individuals, hundreds of people that have been faithful members of the Lord's church in our area. And you can't help but be impressed when you think about what they accomplished and how their influence is still being felt today because of the work that they did. In fact, in many places it could be said that the church would not be in existence today if it wasn't for their labors. You know, when the next generation of Christians comes along, what are they going to think about us? What are they going to remember about us? When they flip through a Pyburn Street Church directory and they see our pictures and read our names, what's that going to say about us? Because one day, folks, each and every one of us, we're going to lay our labors aside. One day, we're going to rest in the Lord and the mantle of the church is going to pass on to another generation. This congregation had its beginning in 1885 and has faithful, faithfully served this community for 139 years. Many people have devoted their lives to serving God and ensuring that there would be a strong faithful congregation of the Lord's Church in Pocahontas, Arkansas, and we should be thankful to God for each and every one of them. We should admire them. We should appreciate the efforts that they put forth. There have been many preachers, many teachers, many elders, many deacons, and many, many other active men and women who have done so much, have made countless sacrifices for the cause of Christ in our community. But folks, one day I won't be here. Who's going to stand in the pulpit? One day David and Tom will not be able to serve as elders. One day they will lay their labors aside. Who's going to step up and serve? One day, ladies like Amanda and Mom... Jill, Trish Burgess, and Cindy, and Jessica, and Tabitha, and others who have labored to teach our children. They're not going to be here. They will all have laid those labors aside. But the question arises, who's going to fill their shoes? Who's going to coordinate the other ministries that we're involved in here? But really the question that it comes down to is this. What are we doing today to ensure that tomorrow this congregation will continue to be alive and well, will be vibrant and will be faithfully serving the spiritual needs of this community? What are we doing today to prepare the leaders of tomorrow? What are we doing today to teach others about being faithful children of God. Well, folks, if we will be the kind of Christians that we read about in Romans chapter 16, strong, faithful,
faithful, devoted to the faith, then we will have a tremendous influence upon others in our life. But our influence will continue to be felt after we've laid our labors aside. All of us can think about those that have influenced our faith. All of us can think about those who have gone to be with the Lord, who devoted so much time and attention and effort to helping us grow in our faith. We appreciate those individuals. We admire them. We cherish that legacy. And we strive to carry that on. We want to pass that along. So there may come a day when the deeds that we have accomplished are forgotten. I go back and I look at those church directories. I see names of those who are faithful Christians, but I can't tell you any of the specific things that they did. But they're remembered for their faith. And there may come a day that all that is remembered of us is that we were faithful children of God. And folks, that should be enough. Because God remembers what we've done. Those will be the things that will speak for us on the day of judgment. Those will be the things that will be looked at, that will be examined, that we will answer for. And that will allow us to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And so today, as we bring this lesson to a close, I encourage you to examine yourself. And ask yourself, am I living the kind of life that is going to leave that positive spiritual legacy? Am I striving to influence others in such a way that it is furthering the cause of Christ? Am I going to be remembered as a faithful Christian? Or or is there something there that's holding you back, that's keeping you from serving God to the best of your ability? Whatever it is, remove that. Work toward growing in those areas that are lacking in your life. Strive to be more faithful. Strive to find ways that you can be more active in the kingdom. But above all, we need to be influencing others, especially these young people working with these children and encouraging them because they are the future generation of this congregation. But it may be that there is someone here that you realize that your spiritual condition is not pleasing to God. We want you to fix that. If you need the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, come forward and make that known. If you need to be restored to the faith, we encourage you to make that known. If you've never obeyed the gospel and you wish to begin living a faithful Christian life today and you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins. Come forward, confess that faith, and be baptized. Have your sins washed away. The Lord will add you to the church and you can leave this place in a right relationship with Him. This morning, if you examine yourself, you need to respond to the Lord's invitation. We encourage you to come at this time while we stand and sing.